Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers, is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. Welcome to Northern Lights. My name is John Helland. I'm a longtime admirer and student of uh, environmental history of the Mississippi River and of uh, great photographs. And it's our pleasure today to be in the Mississippi River Gallery of the Science Museum in St. Paul on the banks of the fabled Mississippi. It's my distinct pleasure to be able to uh, talk with Mark Neusel, who's the chair of the journalism department at the University of St. Thomas and to talk about his new book, Views on the Mississippi, the photographs of Henry Peter Bossie. Some of the photos were recently shown at the uh, University of Minnesota's Wiseman Art Gallery. Mark's book is up for a uh, Minnesota Book Award uh, this year uh, in the history category. The book originally was published in uh, 2001. So with that, uh, Mark, how did you get interested in uh, writing about Henry Bossy and the photographs, and, and how were the photographs discovered? Uh, I first became aware of the pictures in the early 1990s as being associated with Bossy. I think I'd seen some of the images earlier and, and didn't know who the photographer was. Uh, I was working on a magazine story on the Stone Arch Bridge in Minneapolis uh, for one of the uh, city magazines. And in the course of doing the uh, story on the Stone Arch Bridge, of course, I went to the Corps of Engineers to find out, uh, as keeper of all things river, uh, what they knew about the Stone Arch Bridge. And uh, John Anfinson, one of the historians at the Corps, said, uh, well, it's an interesting bridge, but what you really need to see are these old blue pictures. After, after I finished that piece, then I thought, you know, this, these blue pictures are a better story than the bridge and I sort of chipped away at it over the years and had a lot of help from a lot of people. And um, at the University of St. Thomas in the fall of 1998, we had a river conference and uh, many people said uh, at that time, boy, somebody needs to do a Henry Bossy book. And I had written uh, shorter articles, a scholarly piece with uh, Bob Craig from the journalism department at St. Thomas. and. Uh, it seemed like uh, the time was ripe or past due probably for a book on Bossy. Uh, his photographs were discovered, rediscovered in 1989 and uh, a volume of his prints was sold at Sotheby's Auction House in 1990 uh, for $66,000 and so really the decade of the 90s he was becoming more and more well known as a photographer and uh, this book came out last September and kind of uh, capped off that period, I guess you might say. Mm -hmm. And wasn't one of the volumes of his photos uh, found on a dredge run by the Corps of Engineers uh, down in Iowa? That's right. The, uh, the uh, dredge Thompson, uh, the story behind that is that the uh, district historian here, John Anfinson, got a phone call from uh, somebody on the East Coast uh, telling him about the volume of pictures that were discovered on the East Coast and something clicked in his brain and he thought, you know, I've seen those pictures somewhere before and through a bit of detective work on his part um, discovered that there was another volume of 
cyanotype prints on the dredge Thompson, which was actually in St. Louis at the time. It's a working dredge on the Mississippi. It's been on the river for decades. And it's a familiar sight to people that are on the river. And he called down to the Thompson and he talked to the, uh, I'm not sure if he talked to the pilot or the chief engineer, and he said, is there a book of blue photographs on your boat? And if so, can I have it? <laughs> and uh, ultimately, it ended up in St. Paul in the, uh, and now it's in the archives of the Army here. Mm -hmm. So that probably floated around for more than 50 years on the river. Book of pictures that I guess on the open market, those photographs would be, you could probably sell that volume for over a million dollars. Hmm. Oh, yeah. That's so. quite an amount. And the captain of the dredge willingly gave up that volume? I guess. Uh, uh, I'm not in sure. In order not to lose his job. <laughs> This is the exhibit called The Vanished Mississippi, photographs uh, by Henry Bossy at the Wiseman Art Museum on the University of Minnesota campus. These are the pictures, original prints, taken by Henry Bossy, who was a United States Army Corps of Engineer photographer. Uh, the pictures in this exhibit run from 1883 to 1892. Uh, Bossy worked for the Corps from 1874 until his death in 1903. There are several prints in this exhibit that aren't in the book, um, eight in all, that are unique to this exhibit. Um, most of the prints in this exhibit come from the Army. Uh, the Rock Island District of the Corps of Engineers uh, generously donated uh, several, loaned several to the exhibit. Others come from private collectors around the country, uh, other institutions as well, like the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, for example. The vast majority of Bossy's photographs that we know to exist today uh, came to us from several bound volumes, uh, five sets to be exact. Uh, four of them are still intact in the original bindings. Uh, one has been broken up and is being slowly sold. About 100 prints now are in circulation in museums uh, with various collectors, art institutes, and so on. Um, the other four uh, are still intact. Uh, one is in a museum in Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, one is at the Mayo Foundation in Rochester, Minnesota, and two are in the possession of the Army. Bossy was originally hired by the Corps to make uh, maps of the river. Uh, he was a draftsman, and he was one in a long line of Corps map makers who worked the Mississippi. Uh, he built on the work of Robert E. Lee, as a matter of fact, who started his career as a young Army lieutenant making maps of the Mississippi in the St. Louis area. Uh, Bossy and an assistant worked on a very comprehensive map of the Mississippi in 1878 and 1879. Uh, it was published a few years later, and that map, uh, one of which the pages of which you see here, was used as a, a navigational aid by pilots, uh, riverboat captains, up until 1930 when the lock and dam system came in. Uh, to our knowledge, this is the first time one of Bossy's uh, glass plate negatives has ever been displayed uh, before the public. This is a picture of the United States Bridge at Rock Island, Illinois, taken in 1885, probably taken out the window where Bossy worked, as a matter of fact. Most of his negatives were lost or stolen or destroyed or reused. Uh, we know of only seven negatives left in existence from his work, and that's out of about 345 prints that we know of that he made uh, during his lifetime. Um, it's glass. It's 11 inches by 14 inches. And as, as it's glass, it's extremely fragile, uh, extremely fragile. In fact, uh, a shipment of his negatives were broken uh, on their way to the Chicago World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition in 1893. Bossy was among many artists who painted or photographed Fort Snelling. Uh, this picture was taken in 1889 from the bar opposite the fort. Um, it's unusual because uh, it was taken from the river, a view from the river rather than the surrounding countryside. Most artists set up over on Mendota Heights across the Minnesota River and painted it from that perspective. 
but Bossy, of course, uh, uh, loved the river and, and took most of his pictures from the river, and he used the water in the uh, process of making his photographs. Fort Snelling, uh, of course, still exists today. It's not really used much to protect us from the Canadians as when it was built. And uh, you can see that uh, in, a, in a picture taken in September of 2001 by St. Paul photographer Chris Faust and printed by Dan Beers that the vegetation has grown up heavily around the fort uh, in the 117 or 18 years since Bossy took his photograph and also that the mouth of the Minnesota River has shifted downstream quite a bit. And of course now it's on the other side of Pike Island and in Bossy's day it was a lot closer to the fort and the steamboat landing was right beneath the fort. Uh, yeah. Now Bossy, as I understand it, was a hard man to find out a lot of information about. He was an immigrant from Europe. Mm -hmm. He uh, left no records of his life other than the photographs, of course. Uh, he had no children. Um, can you tell us how hard it was to find out very much about Henry Bossy? You know, he was really an enigma. Uh, we know a, a few things about him. Uh, there's mo much that we don't know. Uh, as you say, he, he left uh, very few records, uh, had no children. His wife died uh, without remarrying. Um, she left. Uh, very few records. He does have some great nephews and great great nephews uh, still around that have a few artifacts from his uh, from his life. But um, for the most part, no. And I think part of it is that he died so suddenly. You know, he was relatively young. He was 59 years old. His wife actually poisoned him to death, uh, accidentally. I should add. That's we good. think. That's good. <laughs> um, he uh, was eating a Sunday meal and. He was eating some asparagus that had been canned uh, by his wife, and apparently it was canned badly. Mm -hmm. This was in 1903. And he took ill shortly after eating this food, rushed to the hospital, uh, kept him overnight. He seemed to be doing better, uh, was allowed to go home on Monday, but by Monday night it was obvious that he was in great pain. And uh, they took him back to the hospital in Rock Island, Illinois, and uh, he died while uh, waiting to undergo surgery, uh, 59 years old. And he was still an employee of the Corps of Engineers, um, and he had uh, uh, very little time to get his effects in order, essentially. And so uh, when he died, we're left with just some sort of uh, real cryptic notes and a few uh, dates and times marked on maps and stuff like that, but not a lot to go on. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't want to mention the uh, name of the canning company for future reference. <laughs> you know, I think it was a home job. I think it was okay. his wife's, uh, w w as far as I know, according to the newspapers at the time, it was his wife's uh, attempt at canning, oh. and uh, uh, she didn't do a very good job of it. No, no, obviously so not. No asparagus for supper for us. Right, right. <laughs> I'm staying away. Um, Bossy uh, was a map maker first. He was hired by the Corps to do map making and he did a wonderful job of map making um, and the maps are reproduced in your book they're beautifully rendered and I'm wondering he may have had some artistic training mm -hmm. and I, I imagine that may have carried over to his photographs the uh, artistic way he took some of his photographs um, the shape the form the line and so forth mm -hmm. you want to talk about the map making prowess of Abbasi and how that related to his photographs well, as near as I can tell, he, uh, according to many of his obituaries, he received a classic education in Europe uh, at Magdeburg in, uh, in what was Prussia in art and engineering. So he would have been trained uh, and, and well trained, obviously, by the, by the results that we see in both uh, an engineering, with an engineering background in terms of form and shape and, and, and function. And his art training uh, was also in, in painting. Uh, and uh, his paintings are, are, at least the ones that we, that we know of, are, are quite well done, portrait paintings. Uh, his his map-making skill and his uh, attention to detail are really quite, quite excellent. Mm -hmm. So he brought all of those art and engineering uh, abilities and training in Europe to him in, in his job at the Corps of Engineers. And you can see in his photographs, you can see both 
art and a love of the engineering and the pictures, I think you can see the, uh, uh, the loving way that he photographs bridges, for example, uh, and the angles that he uses and the perspective that he takes. And this is a man that knows something about how a bridge is put together, mm -hmm. obviously. And uh, it's also a man that knows something about how a photograph is put together. From, and you can tell by the way he shoots landscapes and his eye for foreground, middle ground, and background, for example, and his placing of models in the picture and having them point and having your uh, uh, eye follow where they're pointing and how that draws you into the center of the photograph. Um, so um, it's, it's likely he didn't have formal training in photography, per se, because there wasn't much available when he was in his formative years, but he did have art and engineering training, and that shows through in the pictures. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't shy about adding certain qualities to his photographs, That's right. too, right? That's right. And it was not uncommon uh, uh, in the 19th century for photographers to paint in elements that they thought would balance out a picture. And in fact, in those days, uh, uh, painters told them to do so. Many uh, photographers started out as painters, and they were advised by the great painters of the day, uh, you know, you need a cloud here. One should put one in. And so it was not an uncommon thing. Uh, on the one hand, and I think that's what he did, he often did it uh, uh, to even out a horizon line or to add something in the sky, clouds in the sky. But occasionally on some of the prints you'll see three little birds drawn in, three little seagulls drawn in, and that to me represents probably a sense of humor more than anything. Uh, the other thing that may have happened in the cyanotype process is that uh, a lot of times the sky will wash out a little bit. You'll get great detail in the foreground and the middle ground and if it's a bright sky uh, on occasion, on the rare occasion when he did take a photograph in the middle of the day, might be a bright sky, that sky is going to wash out completely. And he may not have been adding elements that weren't there. He may have, in fact, been uh, working from memory. And clouds that he saw when he took the photograph don't show up very well in the print, so he may have just been filling those, filling those out. Um, but uh, uh, it was not an uncommon thing for photographers to do to do such things and it just kind of adds to the interest of the pictures. Also sometimes common to even remove trees that were in the way of certain landscape shots, right? And you can see uh, freshly cut stumps in the foreground in many of these pictures where you know he took so many pictures from the river bluffs and you know some of those bluffs are you know they range from 150 feet to seven, eight, nine hundred feet up and he had very few uh, interpretive trails to follow walking up from the river, as you might imagine. I mean, these guys are bushwhacking their way up, up the hill, for the most part, uh, as best they can, he, he and his assistant. And uh, many times they got to the top and uh, found their view blocked by a tree. Mm -hmm. And you can see in a couple of pictures, many of the pictures, you can see a stump in the foreground. It used to be a 20 or 30 year old tree, right. gone. <laughs> to give you a better angle, um, yeah. and again, not uncommon. Right, and Henry Bossy was an engineer hired by our Federal Corps of Engineers. Um, they were starting a four and a half foot channel project to dredge the Mississippi for commercial riverboat traffic. He uh, was hired, or he moved into the photography part of his work in order to document that, mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of how all the photographs started to be taken and, and uh, shown, and that's why we have this great record. Can you just talk a little bit about that uh, and how the core was evolving at the time? Sure. The, uh, the, the big problem in the Midwest at the time was uh, making the river safe for navigation. Uh, the farm interest, the grange, the uh, uh, business interest in the Midwest were worried about uh, shipping both people and materials on the river. And of course, the river is going to be in competition with the railroads. And uh, the river was going to lose that competition, partly because uh, shippers could not guarantee uh, time and rates on the route, because the river was not free, for, free and clear for navigation much of the year. Low water uh, in the fall, uh, floods in the spring, uh, and it was just a very unpredictable way to ship. So the Congress asked the Corps of Engineers to uh, ultimately, after a, a failed try to make a four-foot channel, to make a four-and-a-half-foot clear channel from St. Anthony Falls in Minneapolis to Grafton, Illinois, mouth of the Illinois River. And uh, this led to, this led to uh, a, a multi-million dollar channel project 
that ultimately in the 20th century ends up in the lock and dam system that we see today. Right, with the nine foot channel. With the nine foot channel. Uh, in Bossy's day, it was the start of the four and a half foot channel and it started in 1878 with his maps. Mm -hmm. And so the, the first thing that he does, he and his assistant, is complete a map of the river from St. Anthony to Grafton to figure out where that channel is going to be. And then of course the core, as he's making the map, the core is starting to build the wing dams and the closing dams and dredging and so on to get the, to get the uh, channel uh, free. And then his photos show early environmental deterioration of the Mississippi because of those wing dams and closing dams. And that's sort of an interesting facet of his work that the Corps probably never thought to, right. <laughs> of when they uh, asked him to do it. Right. You know, it's a rare look that we get, John, at the at environmental change in the river on a massive scale. I don't know of any other photographs that show that from this period uh, in, in such a way that you can actually look at a before uh, during and after a picture of a, of a certain part of the river, like Robinson's Rocks, for example, uh, before the Corps starts to work on it, here's what the river looked like in its more or less natural state. It's free-flowing, it's got a lot of islands, it's a braided stream, it's very slow, it's meandering, sh very shallow in spots, and then the Corps starts to work at it, and you see a series of photographs as the wing dams are constructed, the wing dams are built, and then the wing dams start to do their job and do it very well. They scour one part of the river while they settle out silt in another. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the course of 10 or 11 years on, uh, of these photographs, you can very distinctly see that happening. Uh, you can see what used to be a backwater become the river bank as it fills in with, with silt and as first growth vegetation comes in and second growth and so on. Um, uh, conversely, you can see what used to be a relatively slow a uh, wide spot in the channel become fairly rapid mm -hmm. and scoured out by the increased current caused by the wing dams and the closing dams and so on. And uh, looking at the photographs, and you can only guess what that does, the, the, uh, the, back, the backwater's going away. What does that do for the fish population? Mm -hmm. What does that do for ducks? What does that do for mussels and clams and sure. so on? Um, and then you look at the increased current in the other part of the river and you think, what does that do for the fish that were used to a slower river and now they've got they've got something else to deal with right so you know there's a um, one way to look at these pictures is as a, a, a something of a trade-off I mean we gained a lot of navigation we've gained in a, a commercial highway mm -hmm. and a fairly uh, reliable way to ship uh, goods in bulk mm -hmm. uh, but there are always trade-offs and of course what we've lost are some of those backwaters, some of the sloughs, some of the channels, some of the islands, the side channels, some of the islands, uh, and some of the species right. that, that live there. Uh, so there are gains and there are losses. Right. Yes. And, and you can see in the pictures, you can you kind of get a sense of that a little bit. Sure, sure. Do you have uh, some favorite photographs, Mark, that you'd like to mention uh, for our listeners? You know, uh, I like all of them, but I do like uh, a few the best. I like the picture of Mechanics Rock, which is a shot of a man standing next to a, uh, what used to be a famous landmark called Mechanics Rock, holding a stadia rod. And a stadia rod was a device that the Corps and others used to measure the depth of the river. Mechanics Rock was so named because a, a ship named the Mechanic hit it and sank on that spot uh, and uh, uh, became a fairly famous landmark and a dangerous spot for for uh, steamboat captains and others. Uh, I like the picture of Minneiska, Minnesota. Right, that's a beautiful, uh, beautiful rendering. Yeah. Beautiful image, well-constructed, well-composed image, uh, taken in a kind of an unusual angle from uh, an island on the river itself rather than from the bluffs overlooking. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a different perspective than you normally get, but it's a good use of a model. You can see the bridge, or excuse me, you can see the church uh, and with the steeple in the background in Minneiska. Um, I like all the steamboat pictures just because I'm a sucker for steamboats, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also like the picture of uh, wing dams below Nininger. Right, uh, which shows some of the environmental deterioration. You know, exactly. The, the sedimentation and the filling in yep. in the back channels. You really get a good sense of, of what the, uh, the changes that the core rot were doing to the river in mm -hmm. that photograph, I mm -hmm. think, yeah. And there's some speculation that that Bossy knew Mark Twain. Do you want to mention your speculation about that? I don't think that he probably did. Uh, there's no record of it in Twain or in um, 
in, 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 of course, Bossy didn't leave much in the way of records. It's possible that their paths have crossed. Uh, they certainly were on the same boat, the General Barnard. Uh, whether they were on the same boat at the same time, uh, we'll probably never know. Uh, it would be nice to think that they met and knew each other and had a couple of shots of whiskey together, but sure. Uh, and it's possible, but uh, right. we'll never know for sure. None of Bossy's photographs appear in any of Twain's books. We know that. We know that. Yeah. How about, uh, is it far-fetched to say that this is one of the great photographic finds of this century? I think it's one of the great photographic finds of the latter part of the century for sure. Uh, it's certainly a valuable historical document for those that are interested in the Mississippi River mm -hmm. uh, and what the river used to look like. Right. Uh, we just didn't have all that much to go on mm -hmm. before. We had some photos, many of them not very well preserved or not very well taken to begin with, but this is a record of the Mississippi River during this time of environmental upheaval that's a very valuable document for historians and others that like the river. Right. And uh, the art world tends to agree by the high value they've given these photographs on the art market. Uh, you'll pay for an original print, you'll pay at least 15 and all the way up to $25,000 mm. for, for an original print. That says something about about the pictures, sure. I guess, at least in the art world. Oh, sure, yeah. We have did a wonderful job uh, on the bookmark, and I recommend it highly to any lover of the Mississippi River, and it's been a distinct pleasure to talk with Thank you about you. it. Thank you, John. Okay. This is Bossy's photograph that he titled Below the Falls of St. Anthony from the right shore, uh, below the 10th Avenue Bridge in Minneapolis. It was taken in 1885. You can, see, you can see the Stone Arch Bridge in the background, or actually in the middle ground of this photograph. It was a new bridge when this uh, photograph was taken. Uh, Stone Arch Bridge was finished in 1883, so it was barely two years old when this uh, picture was taken. You can also tell how shallow the river was at this particular spot, as you can see the riffles and the debris in the foreground. And a person could walk across the river there if you had strong legs and probably not get uh, not get your shirt wet. Hi, my name is Patrick Hamilton and I'm director of the Mississippi River Gallery and this is the Mississippi River Gallery. This exhibit hall takes people on a tour of the Mississippi River from the headwaters at Lake Itasca down to Lock and Dam number eight at the Minnesota-Iowa border. As people go downstream, they encounter various locations in which they encounter stories, stories that vary from the geology, the remarkable geology of the Twin Cities metropolitan area, to Native American stories at Lake Pepin, to how we have changed the Mississippi River to accommodate commercial navigation. People can do everything from from pick for, for fossils in the rocks to tour an authentic towboat that spent 50 years on the Mississippi River. Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers, is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. Mm -hmm.